Well, hello world. If it's Thursday at 10.30 Pacific uh, time, it must be time for intersections. Uh, today we have a somewhat unusual format, uh, which I'll hasten to explain before getting into uh, the basic uh, introductory uh, comments about intersections, which is that we have an interview with Lee Kai-Fu, who is one of the most influential voices in the whole artificial intelligence area, and his co-author, Stanley Chen, who've just come out with a brand new uh, book called AI 2041. Whoops, there you go. Uh, literally came out last week. And it is a spectacular um, uh, 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 envisioning. It, the subtitle is 10 Visions for Our Future. And it's 10 scenarios about how artificial intelligence in the year 2041 is going to have affected something fundamental about our uh, lived experience, whether it's learning or uh, secu national security or urban transportation or the existential search for meaning. And um, I, I mentioned this partly because um, we are all now faced with this notion of coming to terms with AI in many respects, not only because it's disrupting our, uh, our business models uh, and ultimately our, our um, uh, our uh, economic lives, but because it challenges us to uh, uh, affirm once again what it means to be human and what the attributes of being human are that will be forever different from an increasingly humanizing and hum human resembling set of capabilities that AI brings to the table. And those are issues that um, these two authors take up in their new book, 20, AI 2041 as well. So this interview was pre-recorded because um, uh, there were time zone issues uh, between China and uh, the Bay Area and uh, the Pacific uh, time zone. Um, and we'll be playing it shortly. Um, I think you'll find it extremely uh, interesting. So please uh, stay tuned. But meanwhile, welcome to Intersections, our weekly jam session where we blend culture, innovation, technology, and design. Um, my co-host, uh, Brian Solis, is off today because all I have to do really is push the play button, and uh, it just takes one finger to do that, not 20. Uh, but Brian is the uh, global evangelist for innovation at Salesforce and a voice for uh, all things digital and digital in relation to marketing, social media, organizational transformation, innovation, and more. And I, as you know, have had a storied, nonlinear uh, uh non-career uh, in the innovation space. Um, Harvard Business School for 14 years as a faculty member, don't hold that against me, but serial entrepreneur, continuing uh, voice, I, I would say, for a refreshed view of innovation. Uh, by the way, check out my Forbes.com column because the latest article which dropped last week is called AI 2041, So What for the Humans? And it is uh, an effort to um, uh, define better this genre of scientific fiction, which uh, Kaifu and Stanley have pioneered in their book, but also to ponder this question of what are the proficiencies that humans are going to maintain an exclusive hold over while, in a sense, AI becomes more uh, human-like. Uh, so with that, I'm just going to uh, launch into um, the interviews. Uh, as always, please uh, send your comments in the chat. We will take note of them. The interviews will be posted on our intersectionslive.com uh, website. And uh, we uh, couldn't do this without all of you out there uh, in, the, uh, in the larger world. And so I'm going to demonstrate my prowess of StreamYard, our uh, delightful um, uh, production environment. Um, Li Kai Fu, so uh, it's great to see you again. We seem yes. to run into each other at uh, very random and uh, unusual times. Uh, so thank you very much for taking the time to meet today. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. Yeah. So I, I just want to do a quick introduction uh, because we uh, um, are going to be cutting this for uh, the the live. <clears throat> I'm sorry, very. Oh, no, that's okay. That's fine. <laughs> Yeah, this is All the right. world of internet media, uh, where yes. you know maybe you'll see a, a little dog go by, or a three-year-old yeah. child, or whatever, right. and it's uh, it's a new medium. Um, 
Yes. But it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Lee Kai Fu, who, whose career really has paralleled the uh, uh, evolution of digital technology and especially uh, our AI data science. Um, he's had an illustrious career. I'll just provide a few uh, uh, headlines by way of uh, introduction. Um, you actually uh, uh, had roots in academic life and for a time was an, were an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon. You then went to work at Apple in a number of different uh, positions uh, in a formative time, I think, uh, for, for Apple, uh, uh, working in speech recognition, interactive media, uh, winding up being the vice president of the interactive media group, had a brief stint at Silicon Graphics, um, uh, and a president of a multimedia software business unit of Silicon Graphics before moving on to be the founder and managing director of Microsoft Research Asia for several years. Um, and then a corporate vice president at Microsoft uh, Inc. Um, uh, before transitioning to Google in a, a somewhat celebrated transition, becoming president of Google Greater China, and then currently uh, uh, spearheading a, 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 I would say, a fairly massive uh, venture capital uh, activity based in China, currently called Sinoventure, uh, Sinovation Ventures, uh, which has uh, over 300 portfolios, uh, primarily in China and assets of uh, approximately perhaps in, in excess of $2 billion. And given how rapidly things evolve, I'm sure that all needs some updating. But I, for me, having followed your, um, your uh, uh, career uh, for, for some time, um, I think, and as one of, your, one of your fans, I feel like uh, your career has been um, illuminating of what's going on in the, uh, in the world of advanced technology. I mean, you've, you've said, I think in print as well, that your, your greatest wish uh, is, is even less about bringing technology to the world and more about educating people and educating people about technology and about their opportunities. So it's a particular pleasure to spend some time with you today. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So uh, the, the ostensible reason that we're here is because there's actually an event that's occurring in September, namely the publication of your latest book, uh, which is uh, AI 2041, as I understand the uh, title. And um, it would be really useful. I mean, I had a great uh, conversation with your co-author, Stanley, uh, over the previous uh, 30 minutes, but it would be great to get your uh, uh, take on uh, why you wrote the book and what the, um, you know, what the value proposition of the book is, because it's a bit of a departure from your previous uh, several uh, publications. Uh, yes, I have written uh, several books in AI. In English, for, uh, the previous book was called AI Superpowers. Uh, it did quite well. And I think the positive side was that people told me that I was able to explain AI in relatively plain terms, accessible terms, so that people understood what AI was, what it was good for, what the challenges were. Uh, but then since the publishing of uh, AI superpowers, there's been kind of a downward turn on the word artificial intelligence. People refer to it more negatively than ever before. People attribute a lot of the problems uh, to AI, and there's a lot of fears generated by uh, mm -hmm. science fiction and movies and so on. So I, I felt um, it was incumbent uh, upon me to make another effort to make an even more accessible book to tell people what AI was all about. And, um, and the best way to do that, uh, I thought, would be to use uh, science fiction. So basically to, through storytelling to ensure that the book is uh, easy to read, uh, accessible, and even interesting. And that's why I sought out uh, Stanley to co-author co the book with me. And uh, the book is a um, series of 10 stories uh, written by Stanley with a background on what technology could do, supplied by me with a roadmap. And then we uh, fine-tune the story to make sure all the issues with AI uh, came up, uh, but all the technologies used were realistic and likely to become possible in the 10 to 20 year uh, time horizon. And after each story, I would write an analysis of what technologies were used and issues and problems and how to solve them. So uh, hopefully the book is um, 
a very easy reading and fun reading of 10 stories and some explanation. Uh, by the end of the book, the reader will actually become quite well versed and somewhat of an um, amateur expert, if you will, <laughs> uh, on the subject. And what are the, some of the headlines? Uh, what, what is it that you want people to know for which the stories are kind of the vehicle? What should we... Uh, what should we hope to take away from the book? And I understand uh, just having um, gotten some notes from the publisher that the, the book is relatively optimistic, I guess, about the power of AI to improve the human condition and so on. And it's a little bit of an antidote to some of the dystopian uh, stories that are out there. Yeah, it's probably 80% uh, optimistic, 20% pessimistic um, with, uh, uh, you know, villains and and, and problems and challenges um, interspersed through the stories. Uh, but uh, some of the key points I wanted to get across, uh, one is the power of AI should not be underestimated so that, um, it, so that um, the stories tell a future where transportation, uh, energy, education, healthcare are all disrupted by AI. And um, the common issue people talk about uh, potential job displacement by AI it was in the book is in full force and uh, described are some ways to deal with that. I wanted people to be aware of some of the challenges coming. Uh, I also wanted to um, paint a picture where some of the current issues with AI are being addressed. Issues like uh, privacy, uh, security, um, and uh, transparency, and uh, AI um, brainwashing people and so to speak, uh, those are issues that uh, I think the current thinking is that they would be addressed by regulations. But I talk more about how they're actually addressed by uh, some regulations, but a lot of um, technology, using technologies to combat problems caused by technology. And, and, and finally, I talk about some of the uh, most serious downside of AI that, that I could see. And, and the one I described in the book is autonomous weapons. Well, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, many people are uh, exploring uh, the potential of autonomous weapons at flank speed, just because um, uh, it's kind of, a, in a way, a new arms race, uh, I, would, I would think. And also, uh, it, it, it empowers smaller and smaller units of action. So you can actually have you know, the super empowered individual with essentially the power of what used to be a nation state uh, at their fingertips. Um, yeah. And um, I, I take it from the way you uh, uh, phrased that just now that you, you see that as being a potential problem. I, I think it is a huge problem. Uh, just as you said, um, basically terrorist groups can make use of autonomous weapons. Uh, think of them as uh, smaller and smaller drones that are harder and harder to detect that can identify people by their faces and other traits and essentially assassinate people by uh, name, by gender, by uh, race, by country, by city, and so on, by age. And, and um, each, such, each such drone might only be $1,000. And a terrorist group can use one of them to kill one uh, person or, or uh, hundreds of thousands of them to, uh, to basically commit a mass genocide. And, and they're very hard to, to catch and, and very, because you don't really know the origin. So, you know, the suicide bomber today uh, has to give his or her life in order to uh, basically create havoc. But this kind of a drone uh, can, can maybe very even hard to trace, not to mention not have to give up the kamikaze style um, a suicide bombing. And then for countries, the, the countries are generally speaking not willing to uh, basically regulate and even sit down to discuss, uh, including the United States uh, and UK and Russia and, and a number of other countries. Right. Uh, um, and um, uh, But the future danger of such um, a technology with autonomous weapons is, is huge because unlike nu nuclear weapons, which is somewhat more destructive, but uh, very detectable and also causes uh, mutual assured destruction. But uh, autonomous weapons are not so easy to, to detect and it, it doesn't uh, guarantee any sort of uh, retaliation. 
So the lack of, you know, country A wouldn't launch nuclear weapon on country B for the fear that country B, if it's a nuclear country, would retaliate and destroy your own country. But autonomous weapons, they may not trace or find out. Uh, and even if they did, it's not mutually assured destruction. So it's arguably even more dangerous uh, than nuclear weapons. Right. And, um, you know, every time there's been a rollback of military uh, technology uh, like uh, landmines or poison gas, it's because there has been a demonstration of how horrible they are. But at the moment, you know, everything about auto the deployment of autonomous weapons is theoretical, except for a few animated short films and things of this kind. Uh, yeah. So change often doesn't happen until there's a real visceral sense of urgency or sense of, uh, you know, uh, kind of re 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 repugnance about um, the consequences of something, which is yeah. worrisome in a way. But that's why I guess having uh, your book, you know, to anticipate what could happen is a very useful mental exercise in terms of, um, you know, being aware of the issues. Although we're in this odd moment now where nationalism is a bigger deal. I mean, we, we uh, you know, we hear a lot in the US about the AI race with China, you wrote about it. Um, it seems like nothing has changed. If, if anything, it's becoming more intense. Um, you know, my desk is piled with reports from various US government agencies about the need to step up and uh, the need to uh, uh, combat what they see as being a, um, um, a, a very uh, intelligent and integrated approach to AI development in China with government private sector, universities, entrepreneurs, uh, venture capitalists, you know, all kind of integrated into a fabric of, of innovation and data collection and, and, and um, uh, upgrading the human capital component of the AI, um, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, resource base. So, I mean, how concerned should we be about this notion of AI nationalism and AI as the subtext of co uh, competition between the US and China you know, given that the narrative is out there um, and doesn't seem to be going away, and and related to that, I mean, how 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 effective do you feel China's national innovation approach to AI and data science is? Should we be looking at China as being 25 feet tall? You know, sitting here as I am in San Francisco, or, or is it more like 10 feet? You know, and uh, are, is China getting further and further ahead, or is there parity? Uh, you know, because you know more about the comparative innovation models than probably anybody on the planet. Um, what's your prediction about how things are going to turn out and what, what the underlying dynamics are? Uh, first, I think, um, <clears throat> as my previous book, AI Superpowers, has described, uh, China's advances in AI are largely actually market driven, not government driven. It's a result of having a large number of tenacious entrepreneurs who work incredibly hard in a country with a huge population, with um, uh, usage, uh, more frequent usage of mobile computing that's accumulated this data and that the tenacious, tenacious entrepreneurs iterated on it and built on it. And that's really the biggest success of China's AI to date. It's, it's companies that like Meituan that has you know, left the American competitors like uh, Groupon, Yelp and others in the dust. Even DD is ahead of uh, Uber. Um, in terms of its, uh, you know, <clears throat> progress of revenue and profitability, so so it's largely market driven. There are some, uh, I think, very uh, smart moves by the government to build the infrastructure to uh, to support uh, local leading uh, funds, and and I think those were effective. Building infrastructure is something uh, that uh, no private sector can do. So if the government would go out, whether it's build an intelligent city or highway or 5G or 6G, uh, I think that that has been a key part of China's uh, uh, successful strategy going dating back to the high speed rails uh, and then 3G, 4G, 5G uh, and, and now the new infrastructure program. Uh, and I think the best response by the US has been the new infrastructure program. So let's all do that. Let's all make it easier for an entrepreneur uh, to build something on an existing infrastructure uh, that can be relied upon for, for transmission, data storage, and so on. So I think that part is uh, healthy competition. Um, on the academic side, I think there has been 
tremendous collaboration, and that has that is what has led to the power of AI globally. Uh, the Chinese, American, European uh, uh, researchers working together, and they're roughly equal in um, academic prowess. I think the American researchers are maybe deeper, more experienced, more breakthrough oriented. The Chinese researchers are more numerous, publish more papers, more experimental. And I think they learn from each other. And I sure hope any uh, feeling about the competition nationally doesn't slow this down. I think that would be a pity. And then there is, of course, the you know um, military uh, intelligence and um, uh, ensuring that each country has access to the proper semiconductors and software. And, and that's the competition where, which I'm not so privy to and uh, I see happening. And I think if that's limited to areas that have true implications on national security, I think that would be a good way to limit it. If it expands beyond that, that if one country tries to completely, you know, um, suffocate another by pulling out the rug in some key technology um, uh, uh, layer, such as semiconductors, then I think it would lead to a, um, a mutual escalation and then a lose-lose. So that those are my, my general views. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone's looking for the asymmetric advantage. So, um, you know, there is uh, the subtext is innovation, right? And China has as you say, done a lot of smart things in terms of subsidizing the development of not only infrastructure, but the talent base and, uh, you know, has a national strategy and uh, has uh, um, uh, financial resources to be able to deploy in, in ways that, you know, in the Biden administration, we're starting to see some green shoots in terms of America competes and the Endless Frontier Act and the infrastructure bill. But uh, the jury is out and there is this narrative about needing to catch up now or needing to feeling like there's a, in the US, feeling like there's kind of a, a threat that must be managed, you know, and that somehow we're, we're, not, we're not being smart enough or fast enough or uh, agile enough to really, um, uh, you know, compete. And, uh, you know, as China gets involved in more in space and other things start to happen, I think, uh, you know, and so, so again, in the context of your book, I'm wondering how, um, you know, obviously this was an opportunity to look expansively at the future and you know ai and data science and all of its fruits are not national uh, assets they're global assets and you know what what are some of the big um positive outcomes that you feel are inevitable in terms of the massive deployment of ai and data science and so that you know if we look at it from the vantage point of 10 or 20 years from now things will be will be different you know what what can we all look forward to <laughs> you know, in terms of a better world uh, with uh, some degree of assurance. Well, I'll start from the most opt the most likely and then moving towards some of the more challenging, but still one could hope. Uh, I see healthcare as being a tremendous area, uh, starting with uh, drug discovery, uh, pandemic uh, prevention, using huge amount of now digitized data for machine learning in terms of um, uh, precision medicine, targeted treatment, uh, using uh, genome sequencing and combining with uh, te new technologies like synthetic biology. Um, I, think, I think healthcare is becoming digitized. That means there's data and data can be used in all sorts of ways for AI to play a significant role in uh, diagnosis um, as well as prevention as well as extending our healthy lives and longevity. I think that one is one where there is likely to be a global shared vision and some good possibility of collaboration. Uh, another similar one is, is climate. I think the, the current US administration uh, views climate as an area where countries, even ones that are competing, uh, can and should work together because we share one earth. And, and I think the uh, the possibility of um, you know um, new green energy that uh, where software and AI combined together contributes to it uh, reshapes the the, the the transportation scene. So we have autonomous green uh, vehicles taking us around. So we have uh, factories that have a much lower cost energy, lower cost materials, and autonomous robots replacing people, um, producing things at a lower cost. I think that's something that uh, could eradicate hunger and poverty and uh, rally countries to work together. 
So, so climate energy production may be a second uh, sector. Uh, there are other things that are maybe a little bit more challenging, but I think also important. Uh, one is education, where uh, AI can be the, the uh, symbiotic partner for the human teacher, where AI can do a better job at teaching each uh, student what he or she uh, lacks or becoming a more interesting uh, conversational teacher partner maybe it's cartoonized maybe it's like a robot or a superhero uh, mm -hmm. it's one of the stories we uh, stanley and i put together uh -huh. and, and i think and, and the human teacher will uh, really become more of a mentor and a coach and someone who teaches uh, teamwork and character and uh, values to the students and and that will reduce the cost of basic education so more people on earth can have access to basic ai taught education and then those who want the mentoring uh, can have uh, you know a one to few relationship where much more personalized relationship helps the people um, improve themselves in an age where individualism is, is more important. So that's one where I also have some hopes. Uh, a few other ones that are probably a bit more challenging. Um, uh, one is uh, autonomous weapons, how to regulate them along with cyber. So that's one, I'm not sure it's gonna be easy to do, but potentially it's gonna require international collaboration if we're gonna uh, make sure that it doesn't turn into a nightmare. Uh, another one is figuring out some principles for for using technology plus regulations to deal with uh, privacy uh, and um, um, the use of AI for good and uh, security, and also taking into account that different countries have different cultures. So it's not necessarily a one size fit all. It might be a lowest common denominator, which all countries subscribe to, then some countries can add more to that. So figuring out how to regulate AI so it uh, you know, doesn't result in bias, unfair treatment, um, loss of privacy and issues like that. Uh, and, but using regulation and technology side by side together. That one I think is gonna be a, a bit difficult also, but I think uh, equally yeah. important. Well, it begs the question of who's going to do the regulation, you know, I mean, it's, we have a number of international bodies, uh, some <clears throat> less toothless than the others. But, yeah. um, you know, I think it'll require a new paradigm of global governance because the issues are so critically important. I mean, I wanted to touch on the uh, the education uh, uh, topic because you're singing my tune. And I also imagine that AI and data science will become quite critical in the whole upskilling and reskilling revolution that needs to happen you know if the majority of uh, jobs of today are not the jobs of tomorrow and structural unemployment is another compounding factor then helping people to upskill themselves and to reskill themselves and to imagine career uh, preparedness for employment tracks that don't real they're not really visible yet but um and and to inculcate some of these meta proficiencies that you just mentioned of critical thinking and entrepreneurship and so forth and so on become really important. And I imagine that AI and data science will have a big role to play in that. Yeah. We can't rely on HR and guidance counselors anymore. Uh, no, no, I, I, I think, you know, more training about, uh, so people can be uh, more analytical, strategic and creative and using AI to do that. Uh, just like, you know, uh, calculators didn't take away our uh, advancements in mathematics. Uh, AI uh, and human intelligence ought to find a way to symbiotically uh, work together. AI is very good at optimizing uh, with numbers and quantitative problems. People are much better at analyzing situations, uh, uh, generalizing, drawing conclusions, and uh, creating things that don't exist. So creating these tools to allow people to do what people do best and not having any longer to, to uh, use human brains to do things that computers are obviously better at. I think that's one element of uh, upskilling. I think an, another element is uh, new professions and opportunities created. Right When the internet was created, we didn't know so many Uber and DD drivers would uh, mm -hmm. become a profession. So we should watch for when new things come along. Uh, but it's important to note also that because AI is so good at doing routine repetitive things, any new jobs that come along are likely to be non-routine, non-repetitive. So always need to push ourselves up the 
uh, up the ladder. Um, but, but also, I think a massive number of jobs may become available that um, address another aspect where AI lacks, which is empathy, compassion, uh, human trust, and uh, building trust and, um, and, and, and creating warmth. So, so many jobs will be, become transformed. The doctor's job may rely more on AI diagnosis as the doctor becomes more of a, a compassionate caregiver. The teacher's job may similarly rely on AI for teaching and giving drills where the teacher becomes a mentor and coach. And also there will be many jobs that are human to human service only, um, such as healthcare services. There may be tens of millions more jobs for elderly care and foster home care, jobs that are currently not very desirable, not very well paid. But as we have AI take over the routine and non-warmth jobs, uh, I think these uh, somewhat routine, but definitely high human warmth jobs will uh, demand and deserve a higher pay, shifting, I think, people's uh, uh, opportunities and also uh, have people would, would need to uh, actively find ways to retrain themselves in order to uh, remain gainfully employed in jobs that also bring satisfaction. It seems like there's going to have to be a revolution in what the frameworks are within which that human machine collaboration will occur. And whether it's a new kind of um, uh, software interface, software based interfaces, whether it's new um, skills that humans need to develop as they become more at the top of the pyramid, uh, whether it's making the uh, attributes of AI uh, more, more visible and more accessible uh, to these various professions. It sounds like a lot of the value is actually in figuring out how, the, how those integrations are going to occur. And there's probably, you know, a hundred new uh, venture opportunities lurking in there uh, because each one of the uh, verticals that you mentioned is going to have to figure out how to stitch these things together. If I read your comments correctly. A absolutely. So there would be a, just like there is, you know, a reporter today can't work without word. An accountant can't work without Excel. So in the future, there will be these AI enhanced tools for reporters, accountants, lawyers, and so on to amplify their capabilities and create the human AI symbiosis. And also I think there would need to be a new set of um, software that tries to help people identify what jobs they should move into that is suitable for them but also likely to last because AI will improve in capabilities and we don't want people to you know, move from auto mechanic to plumber and, and, but five years later that job disappears Goes also. Away. Right. Think, exactly. Yeah, and we now have the ability to ingest data about the employment landscape on a dynamic basis and to be able to advise people at least at that lower level of the pyramid, uh, you know, providing information about you know, if, if you want advancement, here's the opportunities, here are the learning pathways, uh, here's ways to get micro credentials and things of this kind. Um, and to have that all occur in real time, which would, I think, be a, a, a real revolution and something I'd love to talk with you more about on another occasion. Um, I'm, I'm in touch with a number of people who are trying to address that very issue right now. Um, One of the key stories in the book uh, mm -hmm. is about this um, job displacement issue, mm. what software can help to address that. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and yeah, and actually there's another related issue, which is if you take a particular job, let's say um, uh, uh, accountants, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the, we always need super accountants, but the problem is super accountants start at the entry level. And mm -hmm. if AI becomes so good that the entry level jobs are largely displaced, then right. how does one become a super accountant? So right. in the story, we talk about the process in which that that issue can also be addressed. Well, and it's, it's true for teachers, right? I mean, uh, you know, uh, covering the content for 10 years and then being told that you need to be a super mentor and, you know, yeah. uh, storyteller and, you know, the sage on the stage is not an Very easy true. transition. I, well, you know that from, and I know that from my academic background as well. So just a last question here, because I know we're out of time. Do you think that over the next 20 years, human nature is going to change as a result of the AI revolution, so to speak? I mean, what, what if anything is going to change about what it fundamentally means to be human? I, I think it is impossible for human nature to change in that short a period of time. <laughs> okay. uh, 
I don't know if it's ever possible to change, but certainly in 20 years, it cannot change. What I can hope for is that uh, if we think about Maslow's hierarchy, that uh, many people are struggling at the, and the, the levels of, you know, subsistence and the dealing with food and hunger. And, and really, I think what AI revolution ought to do is making sure that uh, abundance is possible so people can be elevated to think about the hu greater human needs that are deeper, whether it is uh, emotional, winning respect, esteem, or making a difference to the world. So my hope would not be to change human nature, but that more of humans can elevate to a higher level of the Maslow hierarchy, and then the AI can become a catalyst to make that happen. Well, that's a wonderful hope. Uh, it's a wonderful um, note to end our uh, interview, which I'm really appreciative of your taking the time. I'm eager to read your book, and I know everybody who hears this interview will be eager to read the book. I, I want to. Uh, contact your publisher and see if I can get an advanced copy so I can write about it in my Forbes column as well. I mean, I think there's this, this is going to ca capture a lot of attention, I'm sure, because oh sure, we'll send you yeah. an advanced copy. No problem. Yeah, terrific, okay. excellent. Yeah, I think this is something that is very much needed now, as you said, because um, with so much emotion and misunderstanding, um, having stories that relate to uh, the human experience and that explain in a very different way, very welcome. So as usual. Wonderful to talk with you. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Well, I'm very pleased to welcome everyone once again to a special session of Intersections. We are very fortunate today to have a double header. Uh, we have uh, Chen Chen Fan, or better known as Stanley Chan, uh, who is a leader in the science fiction, the burgeoning science fiction movement in China. Let me welcome Stanley uh, to the show. Stanley, it's great to have you here. Thanks, John. Great to be here with all the audience from Intersections. Indeed. So maybe uh, we could jump into the current uh, project because I um, uh, have heard a little bit about the book that you and uh, Lee Kai-Fu have worked on, which I believe is coming out in early September. Uh, yeah. and I believe is called AI 2041. Perhaps you could tell us a little bit about the book and. Uh, the genesis of it, what it's about, why you are excited about it. Sure. The full title is uh, AI 2041, 10 Visions for Our Future. So actually it's a collaboration which is not, uh, it's an usual format which I used to write by my own like uh, solos. So right now it's like co-authoring with Kai Fu Lee. So he's the expert and entrepreneur in the AI domain. So uh, also my ex boss back in the Google, I used to work for Google for five years. So actually this book is spent us two years doing a lot of study and real research, uh, interviewing all these people across uh, entrepreneurs, scholars, scientists, etc., cetera, et cetera. So, so try to blending the science fiction together with the the most realistic uh, technology roadmap over the next 20 years, like how AI could develop and totally change our world. So there will be 10 stories setting 10 different countries around the world. Each one like uh, connects to different technology points such as uh, facial recognition, deep fake, natural language processing, XR, quantum computing, et cetera. So I think they'll be very exciting to see how each reader's response to all these stories because it's so different. And it discussing all these topics across a very uh, a, a broad range from sure. religion and gender issue and also indigenous people and also the vulnerable groups in a digital age. So I'm pretty much looking forward to it. Well, as are we. Uh, now, why did you choose 2041? That's uh, yeah. 10 years in the future. And um, uh, I, I assume that you had a particular reason for picking that. You know, in, in the old internet days, they said one year in internet uh, days was seven years in normal time. And right. I assume that in the AI world, uh, one <laughs> year in AI time is probably even faster. 
but yeah. uh, why did you pick 2041? Actually, there's some uh, gimmicks behind this uh, choice because when you got the book, you can see on the cover art, the AI character actress looks very similar to 41. So it's a by design. Uh -huh. So so it's something just come suddenly in my mind, and I say, okay, let's call it 2041, and we're supposed to have this book published on 2021 because it's just 20 years ahead of time. Right. So actually, that's how we design this book's gonna be and how the publication date. So everything is uh, start from scratch, like back in 2019. So it was before the pandemic. So after we started doing the, the, the book, everything's changed like uh, totally. So we changed a lot since then. And we have a lot of time discussing with each other and exchange ideas because we all be blocked like uh, where we located and we couldn't travel internationally. So that gave us a lot of time and space to think <laughs> right. So right. <laughs> yeah. A silver lining in the, uh, in the pandemic. Um, right. Well, um, I, I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about the difference between science fiction and let's say scenario planning or other foresight techniques. Because mm -hmm. I remember in the 1980s when I was doing some work for Royal Duck Shell, which pioneered scenarios, they were all reading uh, right. Neuromancer by William Gibson. Right. And I've been reading science fiction since the age of 11. I, science fiction powerfully influenced the whole trajectory of my life, which is another story that maybe someday we can uh, talk about. Um, so what, what would you say is the connection between science fiction as a literary form and scenarios, which are you know, very commonly in use in the business world and you know, right. in terms of trying to get a sense of the future? Right. Or, or, so, or are they converging for you? Yeah, I think that's definitely converging. So I would say like Neuromancer is my all time favorite and Will, William Gibson is my hero um, back in my day, back back in the middle school time. So yeah, so I think there are a lot of similarities there, like uh, from scenarios, for sure there's the, the fun, uh, foundation of uh, storytelling, but I think as a, literacy uh, genre, science fiction has something more because it's about human being, it's about emotion, it's about uh, renaissance, it's about resonate with the people. So it's actually starting from a scenario, but it has to create some connection between the storytelling with the individual, the, the life experience of the readers. So when you put together these two things is like kind of collision. So there's something exploded like from imaginary scenario. So there's something more inclusively uh, take you into that uh, imaginary world. It's so powerful that it can uh, evoke some of the emotions and awareness of how you speculatively uh, project into the future, like personally or like uh, in a more collectively way. So that's my thought on, on mm -hmm. this too. Yep. Well, it makes sense to me because uh, scenarios are often very uh, conceptual, you know, and have yeah. more strategic Rational. factors. And then yeah. they try to add a little bit of the human element uh, into them. But I was very intrigued uh, in some of the materials I read about your uh, illustrious uh, career thus far that you you often describe yourself as an anthropologist going to uh, immerse right. yourself in the phenomena uh, uh, and then uh, extracting from that the story that you wanted to write. Right. Um, and I think uh, anthropology is now a pretty fashionable discipline in, in business. <laughs> because we think we finally decided that human beings are important uh, after right. all <laughs> the human experience. Uh, right. And and furthermore, the importance of narrative and storytelling and so forth and so on to create uh, understanding. Right. Um, so 
what was, I mean, you, you obviously uh, did a big survey of uh, AI and data science as mm -hmm. it currently exists and got a lot of thoughts from people about where it's going. What, what were some of the biggest uh, ahas for you and what was most surprising about what you heard? I think the most surprising part is not about technology, it's actually about people. So what you saw from all these implications of AI actually is some kind of like data digest and amplifying by algorithm and put into a mass scale application, right? So actually you can find there are so many hidden structure among our behavior, our consuming uh, uh, habits, our like cognitive and uh, uh, linguistic structure. So they will be all review and amplify through this algorithm. So I think there's a lot of uh, bias and dis uh, discrimination. Maybe it was hidden in our social structure, but might be review and might be amplify in the future because so many vulnerable groups actually they are not getting so much benefit from this uh, process like the process of uh, technology development and acceleration but in the future they'll be even more vulnerable because they were kicked off out of this development or so-called progress so I think this is something pretty shocking to me. And I think it's so urgent to make my call that everyone, especially from, from the perspective of the tech giant, from the government, all the stakeholders, and also the engineers, the scientists, they have to be aware of this, like how we make the, the algorithm, the technology more equal to everyone because AI is for everyone, not just for the privilege, not just for the higher class people. Right, although the places where uh, AI and data science are being pursued uh, most effectively are in fact more elite uh, environments. I mean, I'm, I live in South of Market Street in San Francisco and it's right. all around me, you know, just two blocks away. Right. Um, you know, China is, you're living in Shanghai, are you? Yeah. yeah. Right now, so Shanghai. Shanghai, Shanghai is a hotbed, uh, as is Beijing. Of, uh, well, I mean, the government in China, and that's something that I'm very, you know, curious to get updated on. I know it's been very supportive of AI activity, but then there's the rest of the world, you know, right. aside from Cambridge, England and Helsinki and a few other places. Um, so how do we get that kind of um, ethical framework built into the progress of AI as a movement? Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you, we, we, you and I hope that uh, people will self-regulate and they will uh, <laughs> uh, innovate on the side of the angels as opposed to the devils. But I think we're also uh, well aware that people are trying to um, squeeze every ounce of performance out of AI to, to make more money or to create a stronger military or to create uh, disinformation campaigns and things of that kind. So how does that work out? And as you peered into the future, 20 years, um, how are we going to actually uh, manage to, to stay uh, ethical and, 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 and humane uh, with all this new technology? Yeah, as I heard from the news recently, like there's something happening from like the Google ethical uh, committee, there's some problems there. So um, actually it triggered a lot of discussion around. So I think in the future, I think there must be something uh, more inter uh, sector and also interdisciplinary. So not only to drive by the tech giant because there are so many uh, interests behind this and maybe they are not have enough uh, power or drive to, to kick off this project. So it might be drive by uh, several different uh, interest uh, stakeholders and also they have to be very inclusive, not only the engineers, but also like you mentioned, the, the, the anthropologist, also the sociologist, even the novel writers as, as myself. So yeah. I think, yeah, so all of this uh, 
experts must have their take on this uh, issues. So all their perspective matters. So I think in the next 20 years, I can see the Chinese government and also from, from legal perspective, actually they're very actively uh, engaging with this uh, academic people and also the industry people. So try to roll out some of the new AI regulation and laws. So I can see that will become a big train in the future, not only in China, but also around the world. So the problem is how we can create this kind of consensus internationally because technology is beyond the boundaries. Right. So it's not supposed to be like, this is for China, this is for US, this is for Europe, but we have to create something based on the same opinion or agreement such as like in Paris or Kyoto so it's uh, upon like climate change but also we have to build on build up something uh to agree it on on AI or technology as well it's I'm happy to hear you say that I think a lot of people are connecting AI and data science to the rise of nationalism and of course, you know, China is uh, very um, proud now about its accomplishments. And we just um, saw the, uh, the anniversary celebrations and things of this right. kind. And I think in America, there's this, you know, underlying worry about are we losing uh, our eminence in the world? And so there are a lot of people that are um, portraying the technology competition as a national competition and as a race for the high ground of national security and um, uh, economic strength and so forth and so on. D did your uh, peering into the next 20 years uh, have uh, anything um, interesting to say about the, uh, the, yeah. the, the competitive landscape? And is there, should we have competition at all? I mean, you're talking about yeah. a very enlightened global perspective, but you know, people are also worried about uh, conflicts and uh, economic war and things of this kind. Right. So as a science fiction writer and idealist, so I would say like, <laughs> like this kind of arm raising and also competition is totally like a too nationalism and too ego driven, I'll say. So I can see that's only one possibility that forced the human being to work together across these ideologies and like politics. So that's one external and universal disaster, just as pandemic. So maybe it's from the outer space, maybe from the deep ocean, maybe from the Antarctica, like from the melting iceberg, something like that. So maybe there'll be something from external like pressure to pushing everyone to give up this kind of competition and start to put putting all these resources and talents together. So, but I'm not optimistic about this because I couldn't see that happening because I think from the current situation, especially this two years, I, I can see this kind of competition or arm raising is getting even more intense. Right. Not, not only in AI, but also in outer space on the moon, even on the Mars. So yeah, I think sadly, we might have to live with it for such a long time until maybe the whole human civilization and our awareness like uplift to another level. So I think that's totally science fictional in my perspective. But uh, I think the only way I can do is writing stories to from storytelling maybe you can create a little piece by piece to this kind of consensus right so not not to everyone but maybe to a lot of people which might have this kind of high hope well you can certainly warn people also about uh, right. what you might imagine uh, the a bad outcome to be i mean that there and science fiction is full of stories about how um a crisis is created by a group of scientists, uh, you know, who right. think that say that there's going to be a collision with a, another heavenly body, and that hem humanity has to come together to, um, you know, cure this problem, and right. it overcomes a lot of, of nationalism. Um, 
So I'm wondering in your thinking, I mean, what's the worst thing that could happen? You know, if the technology continues to advance and uh, we don't have this moral compass, what, what's the worst thing in your kind of storytelling imagination? What should we be most worried about? I think uh, in the book, uh, Air 2041, there's one story talking about autonomous weapon. Mm -hmm. So I imagine in the future, actually, the, the, the uh, terrorism actually can be uh, uh, controlled or manipulated by uh, one individual. So he might be super rich and might be super knowledgeable, can leverage all this kind of technology such as blockchain and a AI and, and uh, autonomous uh, manufacturing. So he can build up this kind of army of his own. So that's one thing is quite, prob is quite probably happen in the future because everything is so ready for this kind of uh, so-called the, the, the single man terrorist. So he can he can trigger this kind of planetary terrorism attack just by one man, and that's unpredictable and that's so difficult to avoid. So I think it could really happen. So I think that, the, but the the in my story it it was triggered by climate change actually. So it could be very interesting linkage between the two so I, i'm pretty looking forward to to your response to that story as well and another thing i think is like mental crisis like psychology crisis and spiritual crisis uh in, in on certain level because we can see that under this kind of open competitive society like uh, super high pressure environment i think there's a lot of uh psychology or mental issues happen everywhere it's become a huge scale of pro of social problem so i think that might be the biggest challenge in front of us as a whole human being how we maintain our mental healthy how mm -hmm. we maintain our, our, our status of well-being well, um, there was a really interesting article uh, that came out yesterday about how a lot of young Chinese professionals are opting for a, a slower life, you know, so they're getting out right. of the high pressure career and they're moving to Yunnan province or, right. you know, or they're marrying someone who can take them out of China and they can retire at the age of 40 or 50 instead of having to work. Uh, I think they said 996 is the, yeah. uh, the schedule. <laughs> Right. Um, and so and that's one problem. And then the other, of course, is uh, people, uh, many people who will have difficulty upskilling themselves will right. feel, I think, inferior to or unable to cope with uh, or unable to find opportunities. And so obviously that's not a good place to be uh, either. And they will also see that some people are big winners, you know, because maybe they got the right education or they can mm -hmm. have the human machine hybrid, uh, you know, business model for themselves, centaur intelligence and so on. Um, so I think the disruption and the uncertainty will, I agree with you, will be a, a huge potential uh, public health problem, you know, in a way, which, you know, as you know, from reading a lot of science fiction, there's also the Luddite backlash, right? Where people say, well, we have to smash the machines now because they've taken our jobs away or they've made us miserable. And, right. and yet, um, I, I, knowing about uh, uh, Lee Kai-Fu's work and I think some of your work as well, the idea that the technology has a very optimistic uh, face to it and will actually make things better for us um, is, is a very uh, important theme in your work as well. So uh, uh, it's a kind of a confused picture in a way, <laughs> I, I would think. Right, right, because uh, I've read science fiction since kids, so I've read so many dystopian stories. So mm -hmm. it's basically about AI, about robots. So I think we've created enough dark future for all the mass audience so i think right now it's time to create something more optimistic 
more bright, brighter future of, uh, for the next generation, especially because if you try to create a future we want to live in, you have to build up some kind of belief that mm -hmm. we're supposed to do, right? So that's something we're fighting for. So I think using our imagination, like as storytelling. So I think we try to portray this kind of positive future, like how artificial intelligence as technology can empowering the individual and society on certain levels. So, and we put in, in different culture, different uh, identity to see how they react to the future shock induced by AI. So I think that's something I really would love to explore because right now the reality sucks and everyone the reality is, sucks, uh -huh. yeah, is living in this kind of miserable status. So I think right now we need something give us some hope. hope. Well, what do you mean? What do you mean we're in this miserable stage or state? Uh, <laughs> what, what's, what's the most miserable thing? right now i think now the most miserable miserable thing is um for one thing the pandemic never stops mm -hmm. as we can predict so there's so many unpredictable variants right. coming out and the second is this kind of uh uh alienation not only individual to individual but only class to class society to society country to country so i couldn't see that being solved in the near future in a very short period mm -hmm. uh, as well so i think that's very miserable because yeah. there's so many good friends around the world but right now we couldn't even have close contact because there's so many differences on ideology or on politics that make me feel sad so i think that's something i really would love to respond with with science fiction yeah right so that's my thought got it so what are the two or three things you think we can most look forward to in terms of ai and data science making our individual lives and our collective lives better you know, now that you've looked over yeah. the whole horizon, what 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 are the two or three things we can most look forward to? I think the first one is from like uh, we can use AI to predict uh, protein structure folding, so as alpha fold, so we can prepare the vaccine and also the medicine in the in a super shortened time because it used to be years, but yeah. In the future, it might be month and even shorter. So that might save millions of lives. So that matters. And the second, I think uh, maybe in the future, the um, we can have this kind of uh, AI technology help us to identify the authenticity of the message or information on across all the streaming platform. So because as you know there's so many rumors and so many bias and discriminations and misleading message across the, the the social media so i think in the future some kind of anti deep fake technology can help people to identify which one is real which one is not or the percentage between the two so i think that's very critical for people to think have this kind of independent thinking and also uh to to identify the, the the reality so and the third one i would say is leveraging ai to protect our ecosystem and also to fight against the climate change so i uh, also like there's a story in the book is happened in Brisbane, in Australia. Actually, like scientists using AI and robots to save and protect the Great Barrier Reef. Mm -hmm. So, and also using this kind of smog reef to generate super green and even free energy, electricity. So that's 
I think that's leading us to a post secrecy society that everyone not supposed to suffer from hunger or scarcity of the matters, but they have this kind of opportunity to purchase what they're really after and to self actualize their life purpose and meaning as Maslow's uh, pyramid. So I think that's three things I would love to see in the next 20 years and to see how they become true. So oh, that's really uh, helpful and, and inspiring. Uh, you know, it, it's sort of like if AI is the big uh, answer that we're seeking with all this venture capital and activity, what's the question that we're trying to solve, right? So it really matters what the questions are right. that we're bringing uh, to the table. Um, so in the time we have left, I'm curious to know uh, a bit more about what's on your mind now with regard to uh, uh, current and future science fiction projects. I know you wrote a, um, a novel uh, that was widely circulated uh, over here in the US about uh, the whole kind of waste uh, right. uh, dystopia and that there might be a sequel in the works. What, yeah. what's, what's interesting to you now? And I also was intrigued to learn that you've, you've been looking at some of the, the if I can, say this correctly, the shamanistic practices in Southern yes. China and things like yes. that. It's pretty interesting. So <laughs> what's, what's on your mind these days? Yeah, actually, uh, because pandemic really changed a lot because if um, I, I, I was triggered to explore so many like minority uh, settlement and also have encounter with this uh, kind of shamanism rituals, etc. So I have a uh, a deeper understanding of the whole tradition and what's the narrative behind that. So I'm trying to figure out how to combine technology, especially like all this kind of uh, uh, environmentalism, uh, sustainability with this traditional shamanism narratives. So it could be very interesting because it's just like retelling the mythology on certain level. So I think there's something I try to explore and it's very Chinese or very Eastern. There's mm -hmm. something there is deeply connect the word as not from a materialism perspective, but from a more spiritual perspective, I would say, but it's also technology. Well, I think uh, the theory anyway is that AI will give us more uh, time and available energy to self-actualize, as you said, and also to uh, kind of do the things that humans do best, which is, you know, make make music and, uh, nice. <laughs> you know, um, help other human beings and be good teachers and be good students and, uh, um, and explore the spirit. Um, that's the hope anyway. And I think for, for many of us, that will be true. Um, just out of curiosity, have you ever read the Hyperion Cantos by Dan Simmons? Sure, that's my favorite too. It's my yeah. favorite. I just re I'm just rereading it, uh, them for the Already. third time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The first one, all four of them. All four. All four. Oh wow. Um, and the reason I brought it up is because um, you know he has this notion of um, different uh, approaches to AI. You know right. that there are the uh, different warring AIs, you know, it's amazing that he wrote these books 25 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, that there there are uh, different uh, attitudes that AIs uh, evolve with regard to the value of humans, mm -hmm. but that the ultimate uh, uh, destination of all of these books is a, a, a raising up of the human spirit right. and uh, bringing the human spirit in a way into a new realm. Right. Uh, so I, I, I would imagine that you'd, you'd read it, but I, I just wanted to check. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, Fantastic. when I was uh, 11, um, you know, in America, we had, you know, comic books uh, had uh, advertisements for book clubs. And uh, there was something called the Science Fiction Book Club of America, where for 10 cents, you wow. would be given uh, several hardcover science fiction books. And then, you know, obviously, they wanted you to keep buying them. Right. And the, the one that I read when I was 11 was called The Voyage of the Space Beagle by A.E. Van mm -hmm. Vogt. Yeah. yeah, I know and, that. Yeah. yeah. And so there was the, the Nexialist, right? The Nexialist uh, came onto the expedition, the big interstellar spaceship, and 
he was from a new discipline that nobody respected, but then because he had a very integrative uh, uh, um, uh, uh, set of disciplines, you know, engineering and military and psychology and communications and leadership and many things, he was able single-handedly to turn things around. And I remember uh, at the age of 11, making the decision that that was gonna be my career path. Uh, wow. <laughs> and wow. so uh, in a funny kind of way, even though that discipline didn't exist, that's what I've been doing is filling out that, uh, those categories in terms of what I've learned. So I'm very aware of the power of science fiction. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't know if I've read as much as you have, but I've certainly read a lot. Yeah, I think so. So I think the book I read uh, in my around 11 or 13 is uh, Rendezvous with Rama by Arthur oh, yeah, C. Clarke. Arthur C. Clarke, sure, with the motives yeah. and... Uh, yeah, 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 that's totally shocking. Yeah. So I think that's totally changed my 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 mind towards the universe and also civilization so it's also have something very mystical there yeah. it's not pure scientific one so i think that's something more attractive to me back in the day right you never find out what the uh modis are you right it's right. A, right. they're kind of a cosmic force right well we have uh our friend yeah. uh yeah. lee kai fu here <laughs> I so um, I so don't, I, you know, um, I'm I'm flexible. We can uh, we can do this as a threesome, but I think we've we've covered what we need to cover. Um, yeah, sure, sure. I mean, it was a real pleasure uh, meeting you. Thank you very I'm much glad. for your contributions, and I look forward to you know tracking your progress. Thank you so much, Joe. Yeah. Have a good day. Yeah, nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Well, there you have it, a, a first in terms of a pre-recorded interview, and it went uh, slightly longer than usual, but I think you uh, see um, uh, what a great uh, set of, uh, and revealing set of conversations there were. So until next week, take care, stay safe, see you soon.